Hele, jak se tohle to řeší? A přes fakt nechci to Zkouším. Tak, dobrý. Slyšíte mě? Test. OK. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, cool. Thanks everyone for coming. So, um, it's unusual to visit today. It's great to see that many people in our meetup again. Uh, so, thanks for coming. So tonight we have two speakers lined up. Uh, first of them is Kuba Janeček, who will present his recent project. So Kuba has, is working in the vast as a lead software engineer, and he has been dealing with functional, he has been sort of preaching functional programming for a long time. And today he will present his year, years long experience around building microservices and web applications with Scala. So he will talk about a project called uh, Scala Server Toolkit, which provides a way of composable components that allows you to, to build several kinds of web applications. So he will talk about that. So thanks, Kuba. And then uh, our next speaker is VM, who in fact did us a great favor and agreed to travel all the way from Hamburg to Prague to speak for us tonight. She is uh, she's an FPM enthusiast and uh, Zio contributor and also seasoned speaker. So today she will actually give us a practical example of how functional libraries like Zio can be used in uh, for building real world applications that are performant and scalable. Uh, so thanks both speakers for coming, accepting our uh, request and just handing over to Kuba, who starts this talk now. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> okay, can you hear me well? Yeah, perfect. So, hi, my name is Jakub Janeček, as was said by Tomáš. Thank you for inviting me. At this point, I wanted to introduce myself, but Tomáš did it for me, so let's scratch this part of this presentation. Uh, today, uh, well, maybe first, funny story. I joined Avast more than seven years ago because Avast was one of the few companies doing Scala at that point. Like, there were like two or three companies doing that. I wouldn't be here if they weren't doing Scala, so I'm glad for that. Today, I would like to tell you a story about Scala Server Toolkit. Uh, Scala Server Toolkit is a new project I've been working on for more than two months, I guess. And it's a new project by Avast, and we like to call it culmination of best practices from Avast for doing backend microservices. Uh, we did it because we wanted to simplify our lives, and we also think that it can help, help out many others in the world, so that's why we open sourced it. It's up on GitHub, of course, and today I would like to tell you a bit about the history of this project, uh, how it came to be. <laughs> and what it can offer you, and I will show you some code in the end. So, first of all, some history. Uh, Scala has been used at Avast for more than eight years, or nine, even. <laughs> uh, it started around the year 2011. Uh, it's also the time when I joined this company. And as Scala developers, we went through the usual stages of of Scala developers, which means that at the beginning you use Scala as better Java, right? It gives you, it gives you nicer syntax, it's more flexible, you can make your own control structures, but you still do a lot of mutation, uh, you don't care about side effects. Uh, it's the regular Java, but written in Scala, basically. Later, when you get more experienced, you you do what, what I call idiomatic Scala, which means you switch to more expression-oriented programming. Everything is an expression which returns some value, and you compose these expressions together to, to get some result. You, you get to the full potential of Scala collections. They are very powerful, and so you start to use them a lot. And 
this is a very, at this point, it's, Scala offers you a very nice balance of uh, pragmatism, and it's not very hard to get to this stage. Uh, you usually mix uh, object-oriented programming with functional programming. You strike the right balance. So if anyone is at this stage, I encourage you to, well, stay there if, it of, if it's enough for you. But usually, Scala developers, as they read articles on the internet, watch videos from conferences, and, well, learn more and more about Scala, you usually get to functional programming. And, well, I call it here functional Scala. And for me, this is the, the last stage where we're at right now. We're fully invested into doing functional programming in Scala. And at this point, uh, you start to hear about terms like monads, algebraic laws, referential transparency. Uh, maybe I should ask, how many of you are doing some level of functional programming in Scala or other language? Yeah, well, so you know. Uh, another question, how many of you know Zio? Okay, okay. So, currently we're at this stage. Uh, we have several teams, smaller teams doing Scala. Each team is basically separate. And in the past, we have been writing a lot of in-house solutions. For example, we've written two uh, HTTP frameworks for doing microservices. We have our own HTTP client. We have library for monitoring for metrics. And it might sound scary <laughs> when I say this, but you should understand that when we were writing these things, it made sense. It, it, nothing was offered out on, in the internet that could solve our problems at that point. So we wrote those solutions. Things changed. Nowadays, there's a lot of solutions that we can use, open source solutions. So our focus nowadays is to go and use more open source and also give back by creating this project, of course. So this is the history. Of course, there are issues or problems that we want to solve. Our problem was that there is or at least I don't know of any existing unified approach to initialization and integration of different open source libraries. Uh, Zio is trying to do something like that nowadays, but when we were starting with this, Zio wasn't at that point again. We have a lot of diverse code bases because there's smaller teams doing different stuff. We weren't always synced how to do things. So whenever you come to some project, you might be surprised what you see because over time, it, it, the, the style we use changed a lot. So that's another problem. And the last problem is getting newcomers up to speed is, is difficult. Of course, the internal documentation is not perfect. Uh, they don't know the internal solutions. And the open source solutions that, that are offered nowadays, again, it's quite difficult to teach people how to combine them in a way we like it because you don't want to just let anyone try it their way, right? So the solution is Scala Server Toolkit, basically. That's the idea why it was born. Uh, we decided that we want to use as much open source as we can. So that's the first thing. And we want to solve the problem of, of unified way of doing things, of, of initialization of components, and how to integrate stuff together, for example, uh, dependency injection, that's another topic that's not really solved in the Scala community, right? There's, in Scala community, everything has many solutions, but the community isn't unified on what's the best solution. So we're trying to, we're trying to provide some solution, at least. And Scala, as I said, Scala Server Toolkit is a culmination of best, best practices that we've uh, gathered together over many years of doing Scala and backend microservices. <clears throat> so, when I was starting with the project, I decided to put some design rules that would guide the development for me and also for the future when more contributors join me. Uh, because I wanted the project to be successful and it should provide you with some quality code. So one of the cornerstones uh, 
that guided my development was that I want the thing to be modular and I want to have as, as less dependencies as, as possible. So the project is split into many small sub-projects based on dependencies and I will explain how it works a bit later. I also decided that it will promote functional programming, so basically you cannot escape it. Uh, I think that's the right way how to write backend microservices, and I want to teach it to everybody that I can. Uh, I also believe that type safe configuration and proper resource management are very important. Type safe configuration, usually people just load their configuration files and use them throughout their code. I think there's a better approach. Use plain case classes, uh, which is the type of config configuration I'm talking about. Uh, it's very useful in tests because you don't need to load any configuration file. You just provide a case class with all the values. The only problem is when you start your application in practice, you want to have a configuration file, right? So there are libraries that help you load configuration files into case classes, and Scala Server Toolkit is doing that. Uh, and proper resource management. Often people forget about resource management. They just initialize components and don't really care about releasing resources. Nowadays there are tools that help you with that. It's the get effect resource data type. Uh, and Scala Server Toolkit basically forces you to use that. So most of the components are wrapped in resource. So whenever your application finishes, uh, all the resources are correctly released. I believe you don't need dependence injection. Uh, I believe in plain constructors and wiring things together. I think it's the most obvious way how to do that, unless you have some huge application. So of course, there might be applications that require dependence injection, but for the microservices that we write, and I think many people write, you don't need that, so I don't use it. And I don't know how many of you have heard about Scalazi. It's a set of rules uh, some people created that limit the things that you should use from Scala. So for example, uh, usage of now is banned from Scala, or usage of as instance of is instance of. And there are several of these things. I think these rules are quite good, so I've decided to follow them. But truth to be told, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, very strict about it. So there are things, or there are parts of code where you actually need to use now, for example. That's where I'm making an exception. Yeah, so I've, I've talked about this. The project is divided into sub-projects based on dependencies. So, for example, pure config or HTTP4 as server blaze. The reason for that is I want to be able to exchange any sub-project by a different implementation, and I don't want this to force me to rewrite all my code. So for example, pure config is a library that allows you to read your configuration file into uh, a case class. There's many of these libraries. Pure config is just one of them. So if anyone needs a different library, they should be very easily able to provide another subproject that uses a different library, and it shouldn't force them to change anything in their code or just one line, basically. So that's one, one thing. And this is a very nice property of the project, I would say. On the other hand, when you want to use it, you would be forced to list like maybe 10 or 15 dependencies that, that you would have to put into your built as BT file. So that's why there's a concept of bundles. It's basically a subproject that bundles together multiple dependencies which we deem are right or should go together. So as, as an example, there's ZO HTTP4 as Blaze, which bundles the ZO effect data type, HTTP4 as server and client, micrometer for monitoring, and some JVM stuff, I think. Maybe something more. The idea is that anyone can write their own bundle if they want to, or we will provide bundles that we deem are correct or right. And once you need to switch, for example, to Monex task, you can choose a different bundle, or you can write your own. So yeah, I've mentioned some of these. Uh, so what's available in the, in the project? We have, uh, we have sub-projects for HTTP for a server and client. We do have some stuff for JVM, like console, random number generation, and execution context. We do have a Doobie support, which means you can access any relational database. We have support for Cassandra. Uh, 
over the official data stacks driver. Uh, we support Flyway for database migrations, Micrometer, which is a pretty well known library for monitoring applications, uh, pure config for the configuration, and we have bundles for Zio and Monix. Uh, there are a couple of, couple of sub projects in the pipeline that we want to add before we are probably ready to release the first production ready version. Uh, but already you can use this quite well, depends on what you need. We are, of course, PRs are welcome, so if you have some needs and you would like to use this project, I'll be glad to help you out how to add another sub-project or support for any other library. Uh, module, yeah. So module, it's a concept uh, we created for this project. It's nothing fancy. Uh, basically a naming convention. Whenever you have a library and you want to initialize it, so in this case it's called component, you create a namespace called component module and there's a method called make usually. Uh, it doesn't have to be named that way. It's abstract in the effect data type, that's why you see the F there. So in our case it can be Zio or Monix task. It can be any other effect type if we add support for it. And usually uh, components have some dependencies, right? So uh, you have a configuration case class there, you have a dependency on some, you can imagine, uh, database or uh, some file or, or something, HTTP client. Uh, what is important is the return type of this method. Usually it's a resource, it's the cat, cat's effect resource data type, which uh, ensures that whenever this piece of code is used, at the end, it's properly released. All the resources are properly released. That's very important. It's the, it's the part of proper resource management. Of course, it's all wrapped in F, and it gives you the component in the end. Uh, so that's how module looks. And if you have multiple modules, which is what we provide in Scala Server Toolkit, we, we provide you with these modules, you can combine them in for comprehension. So basically, and this is where you see uh, how we use uh, constructors for uh, for dependence injection. So you create a component A, component B, which needs component A, and component C, which requires both of these, and you return component C. This is the result of your application. It's probably all wrapped in resource and in task. And so it's, uh, so it's uh, resource safe. So now demo. Wish me luck, demo gods. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, maybe first I will show you. So the project is up on GitHub at avas slash Scala Server Toolkit. Uh, what's probably quite important is there's, there's this badge where you can see the current version number we have. We're quite low, but you shouldn't be afraid to use this project. I mean, uh, what we provide is nothing uh, it's, it's not a business logic, it's just the initialization code. So uh, I would call it production ready. I would really believe it. Uh, there's a link to documentation. Many people uh, don't see it, so that's why I show it here. If you click through it, there's documentation for all the modules that we provide. Uh, so if you want to start with the project, I really encourage you to go there and see. see. There are examples which are compiled, so they must be correct. And you can get some tips from there. I, I've also written two articles, so there are links to that. Perfect. So now I'll show you how to write a simple, uh, simple micro, HTTP microservice so that you know how it works. So, when you want to write an HTTP microservice, first thing, or maybe not the first thing, but one of the things you need is some configuration. In our case, it's the address it should listen on, and it's the port it should listen on. So, that's why I have a reference conf file here with those two uh, values. And now, you want to write an application, so you need to write your main main class. In our case, it's demo. And what, 
SCALA Server Toolkit gives you is a Zero Server app trait. And this Zero Server app trait contains a method called program. So instead of implementing main, where you would have to run your program manually, uh, SCALA Server Toolkit gives you a method called program. You return a resource of a HTTP for a server from there, and it will run it for you, and it will release all the resources at the end when the application is, sh is shut down. So this is the first abstraction you should understand. So now we can implement it. It will be in the E4 comprehension, of course. And the first thing we need is the configuration, right? So there is a pure config module that has this method make or raise. We give it the data type we want to instantiate it in. This is the task. And we want to get a configuration of HTTP4S Blaze server. So this is a case class representing a configuration of HTTP4S Blaze server. It's all the configuration values that are available there. And these defaults are from the library uh, HTTP4S. They are copied from there. There are only two things that you need to provide, which is the listen, listen address and listen port. And this, maybe I will, yeah. Uh, this piece of code will load the configuration file, uh, convert all the values into the case class, and it will give you the instance of the case class. So this is how you load the configuration. I need some imports here. So because we're using zero task and we're also using uh, gets effect uh, data types because all the modules are abstract in F, uh, we need some zero interrupt imports so that all the types uh, work together. So this is the first, first thing. And then you want to create the server, right? So there is HTTP4S Blaze server module. It has a method called make. And it requires the config that we just loaded from the configuration. So we pass it. It, give, it requires an HTTP app, which is basically a routing. I will get to that later. And it requires an execution context. We can get it from the runtime provided by, uh, provided by uh, Zio. Uh, this piece of code would look different for Monix task and for Zio. We also have some support for that so that you are not dependent directly on Zio or Monix task. But for this example, I will not do it. I just need to find the right executor. Yeah, here. So this will give you the server, HTTP for a server. And I can return here. And this way, it will type. Uh, the types are correct, and it should work, only that we are missing the, the routing here. So now I will write uh, HTTP4S router. Uh, I will need a DSL for that. This is uh, HTTP4S specific, so don't really worry about it. And here I can match on, for example, get. Uh, I forgot the syntax. Is it like this? Ooh. What is it? I have a solution here. Oh, so, yeah. So. Root dot hello. And will return an OK response with hello world. Typical example, right? So we have a router. And if we want to give it to the HTTP4 server, we also need to wrap it uh, so that 
all the cases are handled, even if the road is unknown, for that we have a class. Uh, so this is routes, uh, this is router. Uh, Okay, and now we can provide it. And now I can run it. And it should work. No, it doesn't work. We're missing some import, which was deleted by idea, I guess. Again. Oh, I know what. So, uh, we're using pure config to load this case class from a file. However, pure config needs to know how to do that, right? It needs to know the mapping between configuration file and case class. For that, there is something called config reader, which can be derived either automatically or Scala Server Toolkit provides you with already created instances so that they don't have to be derived all the time in your application. So, if you import com avast sst http server pure config implicit, it should work. Type mismatch. Yes, I know what. This doesn't return resource, so we have. To, so, loading configuration from a file uh, doesn't return resource because. It's already done. The resources are already released. So that's why this, this method uh, returns an F of A. That's why you have to lift it to resource in this case. And hopefully, yes, now it works. So here we can see that the server started at localhost at 8080. And if I send a request to it, it will respond. So this is it. Maybe I should have shown you also the built SBT file. So here you can see that we're using the bundle 0 HTTP for blaze. It contains all the necessary dependencies for this example and for usual work you would do, I guess, in HTTP, and also a logging framework. So that's it, I guess. So to sum up, uh, if, if you're doing FP in Scala, if you're writing backend microservices in Scala, and if you're a bit lost in the world of Scala, as we were, and you're, you're looking for some unified way how to do things, Scala Service Toolkit is for you. Uh, it should help you out with the initialization. Uh, the rest of the application is up, up to you, of course. <laughs> And do you have questions? Um, hi, thank you for your presentation. So what is a resource? Like how is it implemented? And uh, if I want to release a resource early before the termination of the whole program, can I do that? Well, I'm not an expert on resource. It's the Cats Effect resource data type from Cats Effect. Uh, and how it's implemented, I don't really know. Okay, but I, thought, I don't think I you can it release it early. Source. Okay. Yeah, you know it, and you, I don't think you can release it early. So, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, maybe I should say that we're not trying to write some framework that would limit you, or you would be locked into our way of things. What we're trying to provide is a set of small standalone components that you can exchange if we ever decide to stop using pure config and start using something else, you should be able to do that quite easily. Uh, that's it, it's nothing genius, it's <laughs> just code. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Uh, do we know that if we kill the thread, for example, after we start the resource server and we uh, send a seek kill signal from the Linux uh, machine, does the resources released with that, or or they are just lost? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, 
I'm not sure. It's what's, I think they are, but I cannot really, I'm not an expert on this. Okay. It's, anyone knows from the audience maybe? Probably depends on the system and the signal you're sending and the GBM implementation and how the actual mechanism of resource releases. Yeah, so what, what I said is that it probably depends on which signal you're sending, how JVM, uh, how the operating system is uh, wiring it into the JVM and how the JVM uh, reacts to it and how the resource implementation is written. So you should probably write, uh, take a look into the CATS effect sources. I, I also think it's really dependent on, on the implementation, but I think as, it's as much as you can do. Use the resource and believe it, and I don't think you can write it better way, so. So I guess that's it. Are there any other questions? Uh, so I saw in your dependencies that you were using some logging framework, uh, logback. Do you also provide a, a, a pure configuration for that? Or because I know it's one of the biggest pains with configuration of configuring logging. I write some XML, it seems it has no effect. I write something else, it still has no effect. I have no idea how to yeah. do that. And that if, if you also uh, so that. no, we are not providing anything. Uh, Logback was just an example. Right now, the decision is to use SLF4J, and any, impl any implementation of logging can be used. We do not lock much in the code in this code because it's just initialization. But whatever we lock, we use SLF4J, just because it's the most used library we can use for that. And but I should mention that my colleague Honza Sternat is working on a uh, it's called SLOG4S, I think. It's a library for pure logging and also structural logging. It has very nice features. It's in the works. And probably in the future, we will somehow promote that in SCAL Server Toolkit too. But uh, we have to wait for that for now. So that library might have some better configuration, even though I think the decision is also to use like logback in the underneath. So. So I guess that's it. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. So next speaker, VM, will talk about practical use of function libraries. Yes, here. Will you need this or do you want to that? So somewhere. <laughs> Could I put it on your place? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. If you don't run it with it. <laughs> I will <wanna> try. <laughs> you could put it inside basically. Mm -hmm. Just put it inside. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I want to work. Mm -hmm. Somewhere close, I think. I don't know. Uh, it works, okay. Should I click the presentation? Oh. I remember he said that, um, but I don't know how he access it. But. How, to access, how to share screen? Yeah. I don't know. There's a click here and here. Yeah. Yeah. 
and then duck. Uh -huh. And I don't know if I should continue. It's disconnected. It's connected. Oh, I should click. Yeah. Ready? There we go. Awesome. Okay. Hello everyone, uh, thanks Thomas for the invitation and uh, thanks for Avast team and uh, yeah, for hosting this meetup. I'm glad to be in, Pla uh, in Prague and uh, today um, I'd like to talk on uh, how to use Zio uh, in real world to solve real world problem. But um, I would ask how many of you doesn't know what uh, functional effects? It would be a boring presentation because I will explain what it is. <laughs> so, because it's important to know why functional effects. So, in in the beginning, I will um, I will talk about what is functional programming and. Why do we need functional effects? What is the benefits to use functional effects? And then I will take you in a journey of a hotel that faced a real world problem that needed uh, programmers to solve it. And we will try to think functionally to solve it. And then we will use some data types built on Zio to solve it. So Zio is a functional programming library, and I will introduce it more if you don't know it. Uh, how many of you don't know Zio? All of you know. Perfect. OK. <laughs> I hope that you will learn something, or otherwise, I hope that you will enjoy the presentation. <laughs> so. It's important to, before we think why we need functional effects or why there is functional effects, it's important to understand what is functional programming. And functional programming is um, a style of programming and a way of thinking about our programs and about how to solve our problems. And it is a declarative paradigm in which you will think what I want to achieve. So you will do like a to-do list. You will do a plan what you want to achieve in your program, but in a declarative way, just describing without interacting. And in your functional, uh, functional program, you will uh, have a bunch of functions. It's like a flow of functions. And uh, you will separate between the data and its behavior. So you will how you would have functions that will change the behavior of your data. As an input, you will put your data, and then the function will change its behavior, and then you will get another data. You will build it inside. So, but it's very important that your function is pure, because your, uh, in function programming, you need uh, there is uh, this priority, uh, yeah, properties uh, to uh, to write your uh, functions. It should be pure, which means your function should be clear what it does. By when you see its type signature, you see the input and the output. And here, when you see this function, for example you expect always to get an int for a given two integers, but it's a lie because divide might fail, might throw an exception if the b equals zero. So this function is not total, and we should see, uh, when we now see this function and try to reason about it, we will, s we will understand that this function will try to compute an integer using uh, a and b. So this 
we can reason about this function, we can uh, know that um, uh, we might have a failed result. So, and the second uh, property is uh, that uh, the function should be deterministic to be able to test it, which means, now for example, this is not deterministic because the function uses random, and every time when you call it, you cannot expect what it will return because you don't know random what would produce. So to make it deterministic, you should define, specify your input, so then you can test it, and you can say, for a given input, I expect this output, and every time when you call it with the same value, we we'll get the same result. And the final uh, property, that your function should be free of side effects, which means that you should compute your output only using the input of your function. But here, for example, you, have, you are interacting with the outside of your function using the counter that it is defined outside of your function. This is a side effect to make it free of side effects, you can specify what you will use as an input in order to build your output using, uh, using uh, the, these inputs. So now, when we think about more our, like, about our uh, effects that we want to do in our programs, we will think that we would like to handle events, um, persist, uh, interact with database and communicate with different APIs, etc. It's not only about variables, it's more than that. And it's very important to have effects in your program, otherwise your program is useless. So how could we do this in functional programming way? It is, as I said, um, we have to describe everything. We shouldn't interact. So what we will do is to, m to make this program, and our, I mean the effects, make them as a data type that you can put and pass them around functions. And this will make it safe. It will make it total, deterministic, and free of side effect, and you can say, okay, my function uses that program, and it will build another program. So, so this will be uh, possible, and as a very simple example to, to see how um, functional effects would be implemented, the data type would be like um, a case class that take that program, but in a lazy way, and it will not, you shouldn't make, uh, make it to make it uh, execute, you put like only when you call and say run, you will execute that effect. So you can uh, make, uh, make it possible to build this uh, data type in uh, your uh, companion object. For example, you define a function to build your uh, effectful type, functional effect, and then you can uh, uh, do uh, implement flat map in order to uh, pass your result of the first program and, and uh, build another program using uh, the result of the previous program, for example. And by implementing map, also you can use, uh, take the result uh, of the program and uh, do some computations there and build a new program. So now in functional programming world, you will have the, a program using for comprehension or flat map and map, and you will use, all, you will always um, uh, pass your functional effects around uh, function, uh, the flat map, and you will build uh, a new program, but will do nothing, only describe what you want to do without doing anything. At the end of the day, if you test your program, if you are sure about it, you, um, 
uh, your code is clean, you say, okay, now I can call unsafe run and it will interact with the outside world. What is the benefits of functional effects is to be able to control your effects and only when you decide, you say, okay, now you can interact with the outside world or you can also take um, like uh, an effect uh, that you want to use for test and you want uh, another effect that would be useful for production, you can control your program. You can also test your program if you have deterministic functions using these effects. And also you will understand when you see your function uses inputs and produce an output, you will see, ah, we have this effect, this program will, build, will be built using these effects. It would be clear for you and for your team also to refactor your code and uh, to be um, uh, to reason about your code um, easily. This is the benefits of a functional programming. So now let's see a real world problem that we can think functionally with this way to solve. There is a hotel called GVM which host conferences, Java conferences, uh, Scala, functional GVM meetup. He, uh, this hotel um, hosts a, lo a lot of events and they, um, in uh, the last floor, in the last floor in the hotel, so there are many, many people, many attendees will take the elevators. So they will, be waiting and suddenly there are people stuck into the elevator due to a problem, an internal problem and there are people who were waiting and they decided at the end to take the stairs sadly and they become very tired and they couldn't focus on the, the conference and it was a very very bad day for them and all of them were very sad and disappointed. The hotel decided to close for a period of time to think about a solution. So they decided to have modern elevator control system. And they wanted to change the developer team to have a, a, that they think differently. So they should be functional programmer so they decided to uh, order four modern elevators in which the passengers can enter their destination before pickup. And obviously uh, the elevator will take time to move from floor to another and the system sh should search which floor is the nearest uh, to the passenger's floor at the same position um, and the elevator should handle the requests all the time. So the team now is thinking functionally. So the first step is to think about the data model. We will have an elevator system that will accept requests and, and has, um, have uh, elevators. The elevator has its state. The state would contain the current floor of where the elevator is and the next stops. And every request contains the passenger current floor and their destination. So if we think about it, we want to have an elevator system that contains its state and request. We can imagine like many elevator uh, state because we would have four elevators and many requests, infinite requests. We don't know uh, the people when they come. So the first, let's move to the elevator state. As I mentioned, it, it contains the current floor and the next stops. For the behaviors now that will change um, this data, which would be defined in functions. 
So the elevator seat contains these tank stops. This is described actually in the, the stops are set. So, and when the elevator is moving to uh, a floor that exists in uh, the, the stops, the stop that stop will be removed. So the um, direction of the floor, the possible direction, it would be the state of the floor, it would be going up. How could we know that? It, uh, it, is, it would be clear from the current floor if it is less than the next stops. It means that the elevator will go up. And what about if the elevator is empty and will serve a request, it should go up, but then it go down. So we should also consider this case. And we know the elevator is going down from the next stops, if they are less than the current floor. And also the same case we should think about, uh, if uh, it will change its direction. And when the elevator is uh, stationary, it means that the, the passenger is just arrived to that floor and we know that the uh, elevator state is free, which means that we don't have any stops, next stops. Now, for the request, each passenger would be in a current floor that uh, and will specify its destination. So the request uh, will hold this information for us. And the pickup requests, the behaviors of the pickup request, it should be sent to the elevator system. And the elevator system should handle these requests and select the best elevator to serve this request. Let's see our to-do now. We have a passenger. It will pick, uh, uh, put its destination floor, and the, this passenger is in the second floor. So it will wait. And internally, in the elevator system, it would, there would be a mechanism to search which, what is the best candidate in, uh, uh, from uh, the elevators using the elevator state. and then it sends its uh, result and says, OK, you can go to the uh, lift, uh, yeah, to the elevator C. And um, yeah, the elevator would be uh, arrived to that, the stop of the passenger and pick him up. So when we imagine now, the elevator system would have a list of elevator state. And for the request, it would be a queue of requests because we would take, we will uh, take uh, from the queue, and then w once we serve the request, it would be uh, removed from the queue. So it would be better data structure that we think about. So let's see that again. We need uh, to uh, preserve the state of the elevator. It should be something mutable. And also, the, the elevator would be moving. So there is something, uh, it would be, we would have concurrent uh, actions. And also, uh, we will have, uh, in parallel, we will update the stops of the current floor at the same time when the elevators are moving. So the list, it should be customized to make this uh, uh, it couldn't because uh, we need mutable uh, list, but for concurrent um, concurrency, etc., it should be a lot of work. So list it will not help us. And for requests, the we want to process these requests concurrently, and we shouldn't block any other request. And we should handle the request during the life cycle of the application. We should customize Q actually to make it work like this, but it wouldn't be an easy step. Let's see which uh, something already exists in uh, 
uh, Scala libraries like Zio, and now we can see how could we solve this using Zio. Like Zio, for who uh, I think all of you know, what is Zio? It's zero dependency Scala library that helps us to build asynchronous and concurrent programs using purely functional code. It has, it provides the functional effect that built on Zio and different other data types that will serve us to solve this problem. There are many more data types, but today we will, like, I will cover some of them that will solve this specific problem. So recap for functional effect. Now we will have this automatically using Zio because Zio uh, functional effect call it Zio and it has three type parameters. And the first uh, type is R. The R is the required environment. In case if your function, uh, functional effect requires an environment, requires a configura configuration, or requires something to make your functional effect work, this, uh, this you can uh, build uh, an R as a requirement environment for Zio. And uh, Zio, your effectful program could fail with, a uh, with an E or succeed with an A. And, um, to, because Zio has many type parameters, sometimes you don't need R, sometimes you don't need E, sometimes you have programs that obviously succeed. It's rare, but sometimes you have also um, programs that uh, fail with throwable, etc. So um, Zio offer type aliases to help you to make, make it simpler in your code. For example, if you have a um, program fail with throwable but requires an environment you can call a uh, use Rio. I, I, normally it's Zio, it's ZIO, but I say Zio with um, and also R, uh, RIO. But uh, yeah, and if you don't require any environment, you can use and your error, you know that your error would be throwable, you can use task. And if you don't require an environment, but you have a customized uh, error, you can use IO of EA, and in case of your program never fail, you can use UIO, and uh, without any requirements. So all of this is a description of a program. Now, let's back to the elevator system problem. We need a state a data type that will help us to build a state that uh, preserve or persist its value and also could, could uh, use concurrent functions to make uh, the elevator uh, move at the same time and uh, will be updated at the same time. And also uh, for the request, we need concurrent requests and asynchronous, etc. But now let's focus on the state. Let's see which data type on Zio will give us a mutable state and which also data type that help us to schedule actions and how could we have concurrent tasks. First of all, for the mutable state, there is a data type called ref. Ref is a description of a variable, but it, that you can update it atomically, which means that at the same operation of update, you can get your old state and update it at the same time uh, with, uh, yeah, it, if you have a concurrent program, at least at this uh, one, uh, operation you can do uh, to uh, you can get your uh, your old state and update it at the same time so you will th uh, it's a thread safe uh, data type and also if you have uh, for example you would like to compute uh, your state or 
compute another value using the old state and the new state, etc., you can use modify, for example, and this is atomically, uh, atomic uh, operation. And you can build... Um, now let's see how could we use ref to have our uh, elevator state. So our elevator state is ref of vector or list of uh, elevator state. We uh, initialize the elevator by uh, using, yeah, we make a reference with an initial state and for when we move the elevator, we update this ref using the old state and a step would be a function that will check the, in case if uh, the elevator is going up or down, uh, it will increment or decrement the state of the elevator, the floor, the current floor of the elevator. And also, when we want to select the best elevator, we can update this state and we search for the best elevator that can serve this request and then we update the state. So now, how could we schedule actions? There is, um, in, uh, in Zio, there is a, a schedule type that you can use to, for example, do some, to repeat or retry an action in case of failure, but now we will use a schedule to uh, repeat our action. And for an IO, we can call repeat and then use that schedule. For example, now we want to use, to move the um, elevator for every uh, per, uh, period of time. So how to do that? We update, um, yeah, we uh, update the state and we repeat it with um, a fixed a schedule fixed every 200 milliseconds but it's, it would be very very fast so we would um, make it every two seconds the uh, elevator the elevators will move every two seconds so now let's see how could we define concurrent tasks in zero in zero there is fiber that models running functional effect, which means when you define an I.O. and then you call unsafe run, it will be executed in a fiber. And the fiber, you can see it as a thread, but it's not a thread, it would be, um, it's a lightweight version of a thread. It would be sent to a thread pool, so you can have many fibers are running in the same thread, and, and if you want to have a concurrent program using I.O., you can call I.O.fork, which builds an I.O. that will uh, produce a fiber, which means when you call unsafe run, it will be running in other fiber, different fiber. So this provides as the ability to have uh, concurrent tasks. We can join fibers, interrupt them, and um, yeah, in an I.O. we can fork many I.O.s using fork all, but now we will use, uh, we will use fork. And um, yeah, we will, uh, after when we repeat this, um, every period of time the um, uh, move elevators, we will uh, do that in a different fiber. Now it's time to see how could we handle our requests and which uh, data type we can use on Zio for the requests. There is Zio queue, which is an asynchronous as we want, asynchronous uh, queue that will not block. It uh, provides functions that we need. We will take from the queue and 
um, send requests by offering new values to the queue. And there are different strategies in queue. We can have a queue um, with specified capacity, and it depends to the strategy that you want. For example, now in our case, we need either a bounded queue with a specified capacity, which this provides as a back pressure, which means if the queue exceeds its capacity, it will, the requests will be suspended, waiting for a, a room in the queue will be available. And we can use also unbounded queue, but you can imagine if we have many requests and all of them would be performance, etc. we will run into out of memory exception. So this is like the best thing is to use bounded queue to have, um, yeah, to have the benefits of back pressure. So now we can uh, define our requests as Z or Q, and uh, to initialize, the, uh, initialize it, we can do uh, Q.bounded. And to send the request, we only need to call .offer. And uh, the listener will always will take the requests forever. You can, see, you can see here forever. It will listen forever to the upcoming requests. And uh, at the same time, when we take the request, we try to search, look up for the best candidate uh, yeah, to serve this request. And now, Instead of doing dot fork uh, for move elevator and then dot fork for process requests, it is also there are many interesting functions in Zio that we can. For, uh, we want to move the elevator and process the requests at the same time, so we can use zipar. And uh, now, at the same time, we are we are having many elevators that are moving and um, serving different requests. So, when we think about this now, when the passenger will, will click to the destination, we will call the send request, and, when, uh, and then the process would be uh, performed. We will perform the requests, uh, process the requests, and move the elevators at the same time. But there are problems. The first problem, as you see, uh, in, uh, when we don't have, when we look up for a best candidate and we don't get a result, imagine all of the elevators are, cannot serve a specified request. We will not get anything. We will not change the state and because the requests are in a queue, they will be removed. So the passenger will not get any answer and the request will not be served, and which is bad. But imagine if we solve this problem. There is other problem that... Um, imagine at the same point in time we change the current floor and remove the stops, we move the... now. For the, we move the elevators, and at the same point in time, we select an elevator and we update it. We will miss one of the values because we might be in the uh, the elevator might be in the uh, moving from the first floor to the second floor, and then when we select an elevator at this this point in time, the elevator has the first floor as a value, and we will update it. We will rely. On, uh, we will use the uh, a wrong state. So this is bad and we might, we will run to the same initial problem uh, as before. So we should think about a solution. And in Zio there is um, a data type called STM 
software transac transactional memory that will help us to solve this problem magically. We will see how ZOSTM describes a transaction that atomically perform a bunch of operations to transactional memory when set of conditions is satisfied. So STM is a description, and we are talking about descriptions. It's a description of transaction and everything that we want to be running inside the transaction, we should put them in STM. And the transaction might fail, might retry in case, for example, two fibers are updating the same transactional reference, it, uh, the fiber will retry, uh, the, the transaction will retry until having the same, the consistent state should be only one fiber updating the, uh, the transactional memory. And other case of retry, if we specify a, a condition and it is not satisfied, the transaction will be retried once the transactional memory will be updated. And what I mean with transactional memory is you can imagine it, the state, your, your variable that you would like to read and get, uh, to read and uh, write and update it. Yeah, whenever you uh, change this uh, variable, you will, um, you will retry until the uh, condition will be satisfied. And the transaction could be succeeded. And then at the end, when you commit a transaction, you will turn it into an I.O. It would be, uh, yeah, turn it into a functional effect. So the transactional memory, it you can describe it in a TREF, and this could be read and written inside the transaction. Because TREF will return an STM when you want to update, for example, your, your uh, TRF, you will, uh, you will get the last state in STM, and you can get and set and modify your TRF. It's the same operations as REF, as we, uh, as we saw before. And for the object, you can have, um, when you create a TRF, you will uh, get uh, an STM of ref, so you will describe a transaction that have uh, this uh, reference. So now the solution is to turn ref into a tref to use the benefits of STM. And how to initialize? It's the same as uh, ref. We use the same functions only because we have. Um, uh, Q, we are using an I.O. to build the queue, so we should commit this transaction of creating our transactional reference and then create our uh, elevator system. And when we move the elevator, we will have, we will update our transactional um, reference inside the transaction, so we will return an, an STM and when we, now, when we, the difference between the previous implementation, when we select the best elevator and uh, the result of the search will not return, uh, a, uh, it will return none, we will say retry, we will tell STM to retry. This will make this transaction will be suspended waiting when the elevators will be moving directly it will retry this uh, request and to see if it will be um, satisfied now and in case if we find a result we will return a successful uh, transaction 
and uh, the update state best elevator also would return a transaction. So now, when we because we want to uh, run this the move elevator and the handle requests at the same time, so we can use zipper. But because they are transactions, we should commit them, and uh, yeah, we sh we commit the transaction and we uh, run them in parallel. And then when we call unsafe run in that in and because uh, our program will run uh, forever if we want to run it in other fiber or the main program would be running waiting for the requests to to be uh, for the upcoming requests now what will happen in case of the search will not we return none it will wait until there is a change in the elevator state and then it will retry, retry until uh, the condition will be satisfied. And in case, if at the same point in time the the elevators state, the elevators are moving and change its value, the whole transaction in um, in handle request will be suspended. It will not be. Uh, it will wait until the change will be made. Uh, in move elevators, and then the transaction will be um, done successfully and uh, update the the best candidate in the elevator, and we will not run to the same uh, situation anymore. So, with with a very like you can see the code, you can understand it. It's it's, we didn't need to implement recursive function for that retry. We didn't um, uh, do uh, the, um, uh, the concurrent uh, magic, the, lock, the locks, etc. Um, we didn't need to have, like, we focused only on our logic and resolved this problem with uh, just a little, uh, small, uh, a little line of code with a beautiful code and resolved our prog uh, problem. So now everything is fixed and the passengers are happy because we use it uh, ZOSTM and uh, yeah, also ZOQ. And that's it. So I hope that you like the story and I hope that you learned something. And uh, yeah, you can check out uh, the code and uh, if you didn't use Zio yet and I think all of you use it <laughs> because you know it and uh, yeah you can take a look and it's very interesting to learn more and uh, in general functional effects are very interesting also are uh, you can uh, you, if you are interested you can also take a look on um, other uh, functional programming libraries in, uh, in Scala, like Katz Effect and Monix, and others. Thank you all for your attention, and yeah, thank you. Thank Is you very much for the talk. <laughs> it was brilliant. Um, are there any questions? Oh uh, yeah, so thanks for the talk. It was quite interesting. I have actually two questions. One is what's the difference between schedule fixed versus schedule spaced? Yeah, uh, I realized that it wasn't consistent. <laughs> uh, normally I should use spaced, but the difference is fixed when you say uh, after, okay, so let's say two seconds. Fixed of two seconds, it means that the elevator will move every, like every two seconds, and spaced means that um, if imagine if the door opened or anything happened, the elevator shouldn't move only when um, when it is uh, spaced means that you have an, an action. Even that action will take more time. It will once it will be finished it will wait two seconds. But for fixed, it will 
the whole action, even it is long, um, or it would be faster. Uh, it would be, for example, if uh, the action will take time, and then the elevator is supposed to move uh, every two seconds, but there is someone in the door, and the elevator didn't close the door, and it's fixed two seconds uh, directly. It will be. Uh, and the, the correct usage for the, our uh, case is, uh, is uh, spaced. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. And the second question is, what was the thought process be uh, behind the introduction of all these type aliases? Because in my experience, they actually bring more confusion, confusion rather than less. I, I didn't understand, sorry, can you? Uh, yeah, sorry, so uh, what was the thought process behind introduction of uh, all these type aliases? So, RIO, URIO, IO, uh, mm -hmm. task, uh, why, why all that? Uh, because uh, sometimes, sometimes we have uh, three uh, type parameters. There are people are happy, are fine to use ZO of any nothing A, it's fine. But there are people prefer to have sometimes IO of EA or only one, um, like it's, it makes it more flexible and also there are people get scared of many type parameters. So uh, because you say any, what is any? So you should, sometimes you don't have to understand what is the ZEO environment to use ZEO. You can just use UIO of A or IO of EA, um, yeah, I, but uh, yeah, sometimes if you are interested only about ZEO, uh, it's fine for you to use only ZEO, at least g it gives uh, more uh, choices. Okay, Hello, thank you for the talk. I was uh, wondering what is the reason ref exists if it is not thread safe? I mean, it is thread safe, but it, it, is, it overrides when writing. But uh, so what is the use case of it is existing? You know, it's, I don't know. The use case of ref is um, it is thread safe, but in, one, in a single operation, you can get an update. This is why it is thread safe. If you use the same one, if you use ref.get and the next line ref.set, it wouldn't be safe. But if you use just only in your code ref.update, you will be uh, fine. You, at the same time, you get, you get and you update your reference. But you, shouldn't, you should be careful to not use it in other, um, in a separately, uh, in a uh, uh, concurrently uh, that you update but if uh, you use uh, yeah it's not the same to use in different line in your program get and set and you can see the benefits of ref when you see that okay I can use it in a single line so it it will not be uh, um, risky if uh, you will get the last state and you will update it at the same operation, this is the benefit. The benefit. I don't know if I answer it. Yes, thank you. Pleasure. Any other questions? How to test it? Sorry? How to test your Ah, yeah. Program. There are, um, if you'd like to test, for example, the elevator system or in general, the, your effectful program or? Your system. Yeah. Uh, I, for me, I didn't know, because there is zero test now, but I didn't update, uh, update uh, my test. I'm using uh, spec too. And I put elevators um, uh, with the uh, state, uh, their current state, and then I, uh, I do uh, the requests. But I try to, uh, when I, uh, I try to have, like, uh, I do sleep 
in between to make sure that this request, I expect that request will be served by that elevator. And this, I am doing this currently. Yeah, and uh, also that um, actually in my uh, first implementation, it was risky about uh, that update and I realized this from tests. So this is why uh, it was also in the period of STM. So uh, I'm grateful that ZU solved that problem also. And uh, yeah, which makes it more interesting. I think from experience, testing this is not easy. You can either uh, use like test clock to simulate move in time, or you can even use like concurrency primitives to set it up in such a way that certain conditions are met and uh, you can reliably rely on you know, what was executed and by which component. But it's not an easy un uh, undertaking, yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Okay, so thank you very much for the talk. I think another round of applause would be appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so that brings us to the end of our agenda today. So if you want, you can join us for a pint of beer. Uh, we go to a nearby pub at Budjovicka. Otherwise, thanks for coming and see you next time. Thanks. Thank you all. Super nice. Happy to I just have one remark. Mm -hmm.